On today's edition of Spotlight, we have an interview with somebody who sadly passed away around 15 years ago, actor Michael Sheard. Um, best known perhaps for playing Mr. Bronson in Grange Hill, but around about the mid 2000 to 2001, I had the opportunity to interview Michael um, and I actually thought the footage was lost. Um, however, whilst clearing out my attic, I came across the mini DV tape of what could possibly be one of Michael Sheard's last interviews. Um, and so I decided that I'd put this very special edition of Spotlight together and share it with you. Here is the acting legend of my original interview with actor Michael Sheard. You, you do a lot of conventions, don't you? I've seen you, I've seen you in, the, in lots of different places. Well, yes I do. Um, I don't mean to sound pompous, but it does afford me an opportunity to say thank you mm -hmm. to um, a representation of the lovely, lovely people who have written to me over the years. Yes, 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 yes. it was called The Ark, and it's now out on video. That's right, yes. Oh. It was one of my very, very first tellies, because I'm not quite that old. <laughs> um, I remember very well, actually, because I did, um, I was very lucky. It was my first year in television. I did something like 28 tellies that year. And um, one of them was uh, The Ark. And the following week, I did Dixon of Doc Green. Um, yeah, I have worked with more doctors than any other actor. I did two stories with Tom Baker. Uh, so that makes up for not doing one with um, Pat Troughton. Uh, I hasten to add that um, I affectionately call him father, but uh, Nick Courtney, the brigadier, um, has obviously worked with more, but uh, apart from the one he did with uh, uh, Bill Hartnell again, he's played the same part every time, you see, and I played a different part every time, so I reckon that puts me above him. <laughs> <laughs> so what, did you have to audition? Uh, can you remember what the early years were like? <sighs> Let me think back. Um, in the early years, yes, you come back from the rep. I was quite newly married. And um, yes, you go out to meet the director. But then it begins to snowball. One part begets another. And provided you are reasonably proficient in what you do, obviously. And um, I always remember the very last one, which was um, Remembrance of the Daleks with uh, Silk. Uh, the director actually rang me and said, look, you're doing Grange Hill at the moment. Actually, we had our summer break. And um, great part, great performance, but he will never be the headmaster because we all knew that that was uh, one of the kernels of the uh, good part. So he said, uh, would you like to come and play a headmaster? So that's how it, you know, towards the end, that's how it gets. Well, I'm going to approach this from a slightly different angle, because okay. not a lot of people know this, but um, we've been talking about it today. Uh, there is a long, long road to go down. But I had a call from an independent producer-director, oh, about four months ago now. And he said, out of the blue, have you ever thought that you might like to play Doctor Who? And I said, uh, yes, yes. Dear old Tom Baker used to say that Doctor Who is a, an actor-proof part, but I don't believe him, <laughs> and I'm sure he doesn't either. Um, cutting a, a fairly long story short, which is still ongoing, the Peter Cushing Doctor Who movies, there were three um, optioned from Auntie. Only two were made. And um, this chap is trying to get the rights to the one that was not made. And he said, uh, if I can get them, as people have died and the rights have been transferred and so on and so forth, but if I can get them, and uh, I suppose if they're a reasonable price, yes. um, I'd like you to play Doctor Who. So um, the answer to your question is, this came up actually just before I did a Doctor Who convention, because um, being all things to all men, okay, we're at a 
Well, it's a Star Trek convention here, although there are more Star Wars. There's four Star Wars and only two uh, Star Trekkers here this weekend. Um, but I do quite a lot of uh, Doctor Who conventions uh, because, as I say, I'm all things to all men. And uh, when they want to fill up the numbers on Star Trekkers, they get me along as well. You see. Um, That's not true. <laughs> Well, we were talking about this this afternoon in the Q&A. Um, it came up, this um, story that I'm telling you, at, just before I went off to a big Doctor Who convention. So I told the assembled company, I don't call them fans, hate the word fan. In my new book, get a plug in, Yes Admiral, which is <laughs> following a very successful Yes Mr. Bronson, um, I have coined a new word because the word fan stands for fanatic and I don't honestly, and I really do mean this hand on heart, they're not fanatics, they are people having a damn good time which we are going to have this evening at the ball. So I have coined a new word, appreciator or app, and it is terribly important to take note of what the apps say. Anyway, I told them the story and I s said, uh, may I come back to you if it is confirmed and we'll talk about how you think Doctor Who should be played. Um, of course, at the end of the day, I am going to be actor playing him. But um, to go back to your original question, I think each of them, in their own way, were individual. Um, I think if you're going to play a part like that, you have to play it with truth, which I think they all did. Um, and okay, um, I perhaps would be careful not to play Doctor Who as my dear chum Sylvester played him, because I don't want to be likened to him. And I think if you go back and look at the Doctors, you will find that um, each one is different. Now you're going to ask me who I, which doctor I like most, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't on my list. But All right. Well, I'm always asked this question. Um, I loved working with Tom. I loved working with them all. But for me, the one who just had a sort of a mystical quality, slightly removed from we mere mortals, was John. I think John was absolutely superb. And as a wee story, um, when I was doing, um, oh golly, now you've got me, The Mind of Evil with him, it was just before Christmas, and he was a lovely man, John, came into rehearsal one morning. He said, uh, we're not going to rehearse this morning. He's Doctor Who, he can say what he likes and do what he likes, you know. And um, I don't know if you know what we call the Acton Hilton, which is the BBC rehearsal room, but it's... Uh, seven stories high and there's a restaurant at the top and then each floor has three rehearsal rooms and we spent the whole morning going around all the other shows that were re rehearsing uh, singing Christmas carols for charity which is I it's a lovely story and it's in the book <laughs> ah. <laughs> and the Daleks were on tracks and um, because they used to you know they, they, when there was a, a lot of action they were on location they quite often put them on tracks and um, this came, they came whizzing down the hill and they were supposed to go round the corner, but the poor old Dalek couldn't make it. And it came whizzing down the hill and went twing straight into the, uh, I think it was John Scott Martin was inside the thing. And poor old chap, he really got uh, rather bruised. And the, the other Dalek story that uh, springs to mind is in fact nothing to do with making the program, but a couple of lovely people decided to put on a, a sci-fi convention in, in Edinburgh. Um, unfortunately, they chose the Edinburgh Festival when there's so much going on that um, you, you've got to grab your audience where you can. You know. And um, these lovely chums, they're great friends of mine, had built this Dalek. Now, I don't know if you know Edinburgh, but it's very hilly and a lot of cobbles. 
and we dragged that flipping Dalek all over Edinburgh, say, come to the convention. <laughs> ah, now that's a very interesting question. As I say, I, you think about it, of course you do, but I will, I promise you, go back to my many chums and, uh, and, and I will get their input. Um, as for companion, that is a very interesting one. Um, Sophie is a very dear friend of mine. We've shared three agents. And did you know she's probably had it by now, just about to have a baby? Sophie Aldred, yeah. Um, but I have a feeling I would like an intellectual, maybe, as, as my companion. Or failing that, going back to Grange Hill, um, what about Danny Kendall? <laughs> that might be rather good. Yes, I like that idea. You can Kendall. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> Your camera lady is laughing. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great, uh, that is a good answer. <laughs> I played Hitler five times. And you can't get badder than that. And the way that I tackled that part was to put the atrocities metaphorically in a cupboard and then you have a fascinating madman to play. And I think this is really my way of answering your question, that the baddies, nine times out of ten, are far more interesting. I mean, who wants to play a soppy leading man, for goodness sake? I mean, he might get to kiss the girl, but he doesn't get the glorious deaths. I mean, George Lucas, I've been quoted all day. And um, I was last weekend at um, the Marie Curie uh, Cancer Care, their first convention. And um, George Lucas actually said that when we arrived in La Rochelle, because I was also in the first Indiana Jones, uh, uh, but there by hangs a tale. You'll have to read the book to find out. But we got off the boat and there was George. He said, ah, Michael, he said, your screen death in Empire was the best screen death I've ever seen. So I di dine out on that quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, the, the way of gauge, well, the way I gauge it is that, um, you know, we get tuppence halfpenny if it's sold abroad. Uh, any television is sold abroad. And I get more tuppence halfpennies from Pyramids of Mars than for any of the others that I've done. Um, I'm a bit miffed at the moment, actually, because they're repeating John Pertwee, you see. Um, but they're not doing mine because they've lost the colour print. Did you know that? Yes, I did know that, yes. They're not showing the colour. In fact, they've, they've veered off and gone to Tom Baker now. <laughs> oh, have they? Yes, they're showing the Tom Baker's story now. <laughs> ah, well, maybe but Pyramids of Mars. Now. Yes, yeah, so they'll definitely, well, they've already shown that once already in the 90s. Uh, they showed it, um, I think it was 1994. Yeah, they showed well, it. I'd like them to show it again, please. It was a, it. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely a fabulous story. I mean, if I play Doctor Who, it will be a movie, but I would like to think we can get a feeling, the feeling that we had in the studio, the BBC. I'm not talking necessarily about swinging sets or... or doors that don't shut, or flipping dogs. It's a great joke um, amongst the Doctor Who fraternity. I did K-9's first story, and that stupid dog, it was supposed to go right, it went left, forwards, backwards. And if you look at the last episode of uh, that story, a lot of it is done in mid-shot because we simply ran out of time. And... Uh, so when I do a dot Who convention and K-9 is there sitting on the stage, nothing can happen until I have gone and metaphorically kicked him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny old thing. I always speak as I find. And dear William Hartnell had, um, you know, he was apparently a bit of a, a grumpy old so-and-so. Now, I was very, very green. At, um, when, when I did that story with him and I rushed in because he used to be known as Billy Hartnell, you see, when he was a child actor. And I rushed in 
on the first morning. I said, hello, Billy, my name is Michael Sheen. He didn't like that very much, you see. And um, I quite often asked, um, how did I get on with him? Well, I got on with him fine, you know. There was no great um, problem. Um, I'm desperately trying to think of the oddest question I have been asked at a Doctor Who convention. Um, and the only one I can come up with at the moment is the one um, going back to the best screen death ever. So I'll tell you that story instead. I was driving a Q&A and we were talking about uh, the best screen death ever. And this rather um, nicely dressed um, lady stood up and she said, uh, well, show us. I said, I beg your pardon. She said, show us this wonderful death. I thought, oh my goodness, this guy, I've got to move on. And I said, quick as a flash, I said, uh, oh, I, I, I've forgotten the words. And this little tiny lad, he couldn't have been more than six years old in the front row, put his hand up and said, I do. So it ended up beautifully because I had him up on the stage and sitting next to me and he did uh, the lines and I did it and all that sort of thing. And it went down beautifully. But it, it, there are, I'm sure, many questions um, that uh, you know, will, will spring to my mind after we go off the air. But you have got to have uh, a little computer, if you like, or, uh, that is slightly ahead of your, what you're saying. Um, because you do get knocked sideways sometimes by the questions. I mean, it's usually, um, we've heard that so-and-so was a bit of a so-and-so, uh, what do you think? And uh, those are easy enough to sidestep because I like to think I get on with everybody, you know. Either that or I take the Michael because there's an awful lot of, uh, it's one of, one of the lovely things I enjoy about conventions is that it is a happy time and we do joke and laugh and uh, how can I put it? A convention is almost like um, being on set but not having the discipline that you must have in order to record your program, if you see what I mean. I've had strange makeups in my time. Gosh, I go back to a movie, my first big movie, in which I had uh, featured uh, billing. Um, was a film called The Mackenzie Break, and I was attacked very viciously by the leading man, and I had huge scars all right down my face and blood dripping everywhere. Um, but it's called acting, you see. You, it helps. That should, as I say, complement the fact that my poor little, uh, my poor little character was really hard done by, you see. I mean, I can tell you about um, Murgrave's hat in Castrovalva, which was designed especially for me, and everybody else had to follow suit, because I was doing a series in, for BBC Scotland called Maggie at the time. And again, it was the summer break, and um, Fiona Cumming, who d directed it, uh, lovely, lovely chum, who, and she rang up and said, can you do this? I said, yes, but I can't take the whiskers off, because I haven't got time to regrow them. And she said, oh, we'll do something about that. Um, but overall, I mean, for example, I did The Invisible Man for the BBC, and working with Blue Screen um, was, in fact, far uh, more technical than anything we did in Doctor Who. Um, but in, to answer your question, oh, golly, no, I will be honest. I think I... And it, flipping marvellous. But there again, um, you know, you've got to blow your own trumpet. But I would just say in closing that perhaps the reason that I have done over 800 televisions, and it's now because I've just finished a movie, 41 feature films, um, and this I will try to say with modesty, which is not that easy, is because um, somewhere... Something has gone right, and they've said, oh, yeah, let's have Michael Sheard. He'll be good in that. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much. It's a very, very great pleasure.